welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Maria Bogdan and I'm the moderator of this uh, uh, virtual session, uh, which is about um, the uh, Roman knowledge production. Uh, I think it is a very, very interesting topic for most of us. Um, and it has another. Um, So, um, okay, so finally I'm going to be here. Um, and uh, I will introduce you, um, our panelists, uh, just uh, shortly, and then uh, I leave it on them uh, with, a, with a question of uh, after introducing yourself, please uh, include. Uh, the answer for the question, how are you related uh, to the research of the Roma? What is your main field? What is your main interest? And like this you can talk about it yourself much more. <laughs> but because uh, if we are limited, you know, and, and you are very excited, exciting people for me at least, because I know them. Uh, and I know you can talk a lot about your work. Uh, then afterwards, please focus on the topic and try to uh, represent here your statements because they, sh they had to prepare a statement for this workshop, for the topic of this workshop. And afterwards, and it is for the audience as well, uh, I would like us to discuss um, that part of this workshop uh, which relates uh, to the ethnical background of the researcher and to this uh, self-representation, the question of self-representation and what are the results, or is it relevant uh, to consider the ethical background that we are talking about uh, Roma research? And what are the new methods, or what are the new theories that we, Roma academics, uh, explore to ourselves? Uh, or and is it different? Does it make a difference? And the other part of this workshop could be the institutional uh, or institutionalized knowledge production of the Roma, which is another big topic. So, okay. So first of all, I'm not going to be in order, but first Ethel Brooks, she sits there. Uh, she's the associate professor of the uh, Rogers University at the School of Arts and Sciences. And uh, Tina Yukhaus, She's an art historian, a curator, and the director or leader of the Gallery 8, which is the first Hungarian Roma contemporary art place run by the European Roma Cultural Foundation. And she is the research fellow of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences as well um, at the Institute of Art History. And then Anna Mirda, uh, she's the fellow at the Open Society Foundations um, at the Roma Initiatives Office. Um, and then here we have Peter Molan. Uh, he's teaching and doing research on responses of paid speech uh, with special focus on anti Roma speech. And he also works and voluntary works at the legendary and first community radio of Hungary, Radio Tilos. Uh, he's the host of, um, of a program which is related to his research topic. And then Andrew, Andrew Ryder, it's going to be a little, little bit long, he's a visiting professor at the Corvinus University of Budapest, a fellow at the, at the School of Graduate uh, studies at Bristol University and an associate fellow at the Third Sector Research Center at the University of Birmingham. Okay, and last but not least, <laughs> this is Mihaly Shurdu. Uh, I hope I'm right uh, <laughs> that he is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, Germany. Great. So now uh, it's on you. Please uh, respond to my first question of my research. Like this, you can a little bit introduce yourself much more to the audience and you know show your expertise, and then uh, tell us our statement. Okay. Okay. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's quite exciting to be here, and I think it really is bringing new energy and uh, reflection for all of us. So I'm an Amiga, I'm a fellow at the Open Society Foundations, as Maria said, but I'm also a PhD student in my last year of PhD in uh, Social and Cultural Anthropology in uh, Universidad Autónoma, Autónoma de Barcelona. I'm originally a Roma from Poland, but I have been researching Roma in Spain and also in different countries for a while. Uh, so my, my research interest both as part of my, uh, my fellowship, but also as part of my PhD thesis is uh, looking into the dynamics of Roma ethnic mobilization in different contexts. This is a comparative study which looks in, at Roma communities, Roma political mobilization, NGOs, leadership patterns in Latin America and Europe, which brings a completely new uh, area of, of expertise of trying to see how the different uh, contexts uh, affect the way the Roma self organize and what claims they make, how they use to be claims. Uh, so uh, this is my main research uh, topic, but I've also been interested very much in the uh, patterns of the youth, Roma youth empowerment, and Roma youth participation, how they play this plays out within really the context of ethnic organization. And I think okay. So uh, I will try to be very brief because I think really the, the biggest value uh, of today's meeting is actually today. So. I would like to pose uh, just a few questions, a few brief remarks, and then maybe can engage into the debate. So uh, basically, when we speak about Roma, Roma knowledge production, I think what, what's worth mentioning is that in the past 20, 25 years, there has been an outstanding shift in uh, policy approach on Roma. So when we look at how the Roma issue has evolved from uh, an issue related to human rights, to minority rights, to a, uh, sui generis in its own kind, category of policy making, we'll see that uh, the, the Roma issue has been somewhat taken out of its general approach to something very, very much specific. And uh, in, in practice, what it means is that Roma are many times treated as an as a ob object or a subject, very much specific and different from any other. And uh, in fact, many times the Roma are treated, but also inexplicitly defined, not as an ethnic group, but more as a socio-economic uh, economic group, which is defined by, by its marginality, vulnerability, and so forth. And this, this process of, of this approach, <coughs> also a discourse of Roma, in a way strips the Roma uh, culture from, from any values, from, uh, from any pride, or, and, and what it does is problematizes an identity related to socioeconomic factors and problems. And in this process, which I won't get much into detail, there's plenty of, 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 of written, uh, things written on this subject, but I think what's important is that the academic, uh, the academic scholars have contributed very much to this shift. Uh, because the, the, the academic world, in a way, frames the reality. It defines groups, it defines problems, it acknowledges a social phenomena. So it feeds into how we understand groups and social, uh, social phenomena as such. So uh, this whole process of shifting discourses on Roma to something that's completely in its own kind and it's very ethnicized, very targeted approach, uh, it's something that we as, uh, as uh, Roma activists have welcomed and applauded. It has been supported and pushed for also by institutions that also academics push for it through the research questions and attention that they put on the Roma issue as such. So when we look into Roman studies, we'll see that it's quite limited in terms of different aspects of Roma culture or Roma in the society and how it's being studied. So uh, I think now today also with all these reflections that we had today and yesterday as I understand, there is a need to build alternative discourses, especially from the academia, because uh, the academics of the universities has a very special status, it seems, within the society because it's treated as the highest authority of knowledge. So it's needed to push for different approaches, for alternative questions, for alternative realities, especially for the academics. And if we see this Roman studies, as I see it, as a discipline that has been somewhat limited in approaches, in voices, in interests, and also we lack uh, these new uh, currents, right, as the post-colonialism or neo-colonialism, as the feminism studies, or even the, the comparative perspective that I promote to get transcontinental perspective, we'll see that uh, 
the alternative, uh, the alternative paradigm will, will push new energy into Islamic studies as a discipline that can evolve. And in this process, the Roma scholars have uh, the, the Roma scholars have a very important role to play. And I just wanted to mention that in all of those debates that have been taking place recently about the Roma scholars and their status, their ethnicity, and, uh, and, and how this plays out in the academic work, I feel that too often has it been has this ethnicity been juxtaposed with uh, academic merit, as one and the other are exclusive. And uh, if you're a Roma, then it means that you won't be objective. And uh, I think we really shouldn't be putting it on a scale of less or more. Or obviously, the, your background is always relevant. Whether you're a Roma, whether you're coming from a specific discipline, whether you have, you're coming from a specific social class, all of these things play out in your research. So as long as we are open about it, we say where we're coming from, I think that our ethnicity as, as, as scholars shouldn't be really put on a balance in terms of our academic quality production. So uh, I think this, this opens up the question of, of how we uh, fight for equal recognition of, of Romani, studs, Romani scholars and uh, prove with our academic work the merit that we have disregarding our ethnicity background. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and my name is Tina and uh, I am an art historian and a contemporary art curator. Uh, I'm the woman who is obsessed with the notion of Roma art. You heard about this before. Um, my mic is working. Okay. And uh, seriously, yeah, I'm, uh, um, uh, I researched and I uh, published extensively on the conjunctions of modern and contemporary art with critical theories, uh, especially with uh, post-colonial uh, theory, feminist critique, uh, uh, the idea of decoloniality, and cultural studies. Um, I was the curator of the first of Apagalia, uh, and uh, and at the moment I'm, uh, uh, and also the, the intervention called the Romani Elders at the 7th Berlin Biennale. Uh, I also was the curator of the Houses of Silver Tent, or I tried to consult in the Houses of Silver Tent exhibition in Zakenta, Warsaw. Um, and uh, I was one of the members who established the European Roma Cultural Foundation here in Hungary, which is a very ambitious name, but it's actually a small, uh, Hungarian NGO uh, with uh, mainly exclusively Hungarian academic women, Roma and non-Roma non in the board of it. And this foundation uh, called uh, established Gallery 8, uh, the first Roma contemporary art space. Um, and uh, I curated several of, of these small spaces, exhibitions. Otherwise, I'm, uh, I work at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences at the Institute uh, uh, for Art History. And uh, my statement on what the knowledge production and Roma representation, um, I wrote so that I can be short. Um, but while I listened to the feminist panel, I continuously rewrote and, uh, <laughs> and reshaped my uh, three pages, so now I'm not sure I can read it. <laughs> so, uh, I'm most interested uh, in uh, how one specific knowledge production facility contributes to the potential reconciliation of interrelations between Gajo objectivity and Roma reality. And also, number two, how they contribute to our imagined community, the Roma diaspora, which is a process that involves practice and hard labor, which must be forged, constantly questioned and remade with the participation of Roma. Um, so um, I will, I, I shorten the paper and I, uh, I say what kind of strategies, practices are there available for this. So number one is Roma artists and theorists, researchers are looking for analytic and practical options confronting and delinking from the colonial matrix of power which produced social discrimination, eventually codified as racial, ethnic, anthropological and national according to specific historic, social and geographic contexts. And this is how we arrive to the movement of decoloniality. Decolonial thinking is the recognition and implementation of the Roma border gnosis, or subaltern reason, a means of eliminating the provincial tendency to pretend that Western, in great brackets, European modes of thinking are in fact universal ones. If we acknowledge that the idea of decoloniality in the Roma context 
is in fact also suggest that the Roma movement is in search for a new humanity or a search for social liberation from all power organized as inequality, discrimination, exploitation, and domination. Then, as the Indian literary critique theorist Gayatri Spivak suggested, we rightly turn to the feminists who have long known how to use state mechanism so that neither nationalism nor fascism shall gain ground. Roma women artists, for example, uh, their artistic careers demonstrate the revolting against this suppression and how to reject the majority's dominance in order to construct new Roma women identities. They reject and change the laws in order to use them against those who created them. And the Roma art practice takes us <coughs> even further. There is plenty of artistic practice and curatorial work that focuses on the analysis or description of the mentality of the non-Roma, or in other words, the whiteness, and its racism, nationalism, Roma hatred, the main component of the present situation. It can resituate whiteness from its unspoken status. It can make whiteness visible by asserting its normalcy and transparency. To shed light exactly on the perpetuation of the kind of asymmetry that has marred the critical analysis of racial ethnic formation and cultural practice, where the majority white position remained unexamined, unqualified, essential, homogeneous, seemingly self fashioned, and unmarked by history or practice. Uh, I mentioned my passion for working with Roma artists in the beginning. And uh, in relation to the growing violence and physical threats uh, and, uh, um, or the memory of the Roma murders that have happened here between 2008 and 2010, attempts for reconciliation appeared almost exclusively in the field of contemporary art. Paul Gilroy, in the postcolonial melancholia, writes about the need to transform paralyzing guilt into a more productive shame that would be conducive to the building of a multicultural nationality that is no longer phobic about the prospect of exposure to either strangers or otherness. So, decoloniality, feminist strategies, critical whiteness, and inducing constructive shame. Through these, primarily not academic, non-institutional practices, largely dispersed and fragmented, Roma communities could transcend national boundaries, creating a mutually accessible, translatable, and inspirational political culture that invites universal participation. So I'm Ethel Brooks, and I'm a professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Sociology at Rutgers University in the US. Um, I'm also a Tate Train, Tate Train Transnational Fellow at the University of Arts in London, um, where I've been the US UK Fulbright Distinguished Chair in 2011 and 2012. And I'm a member of the US delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Um, and that sort of, I think that, what that kind of thing that feeds from and feeds into the work that I've been doing. Um, so I grew up in a, in a very rural community in northern New Hampshire, in northern New England in the US, um, a Romani community that was both part of the larger community but also very closed from the larger community. Um, and I'm not only a first generation secondary school graduate, but I'm also clearly a first generation university graduate and PhD. Um, and I think that this is very important for kind of how I come into the work I do in Romani studies. Because when I first went to university, um, not necessarily against the will of my community, but certainly there was a bit of fraught kind of, the idea of me going to university was a very big and kind of troubling thing for people. I didn't really understand that there could be anyone who would know anything about our community or that we were actually the subject of any kind of academic work. I just assumed that nobody knew anything about Roma because Romani people were invisible in the larger US society and I didn't I, I just couldn't conceive of of any kind of subject like Romani studies. So when I remember going as an 18-year-old into the library and realizing when you go under the kind of history sociology section of the library, 
that there were books in there by Ian Hancock, by Thomas Acton, right? But also, you know, by the kind of traditional gypsy lorists that we know. I checked every single one out. And, and you know, there are probably, there weren't a lot, right? This is a, a library, there's a very good library, probably tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of books. There were probably 15 books, but I checked them out. And I brought them, so this is sort of, this is a very roundabout thing and it's much longer, but I brought them home on the next holiday and started to show my family, you know, not only the, the kind of Ian Hancock, Thomas Acton books, but also George Barrow, um, you know, whenever I could get a hold of it, everybody started to sort of eagerly read all of this and say, oh my goodness, people have written books about us? <laughs> and the kind of engagement I think that people brought to that, the arguments that they brought forth as they were reading, my aunts and mostly the women, you know, in terms of my community, but my aunts and my cousins, um, one of my uncles, was a really kind of big moment. But what stuck with me at that point when I was 18 and what stuck with me till now when I'm 46 years old are the arguments that people had with the books. Where they would look, you know, I mean, I remember the George Barrow, you know, they'd be like, what, what is this? What is he saying about, we don't do that. That is not our language. And we'd have these debates, you know, and, and the kind of arguments that everybody was engaging with around the academic production of gypsiness, let me say was something that I, I brought with me through my education. When I went to graduate school, when I made the decision to go and get a PhD, my mother was in tears. And she said, please don't do it. Because it'll take you away from us forever. You'll never come back. And there was that, you know, when, when I, I made a promise to my mother that I would never leave like that. And of course, you know, she brought me up as a proper young Romney, and of course I would, you know, I wouldn't do that, but, but again, that's the other side of it that I kept with me. So going through graduate school, um, part of the work that I did was never around Romney studies because, again, this is the third kind of moment, I'll say, is that I wrote a paper when I was in my young 20s and presented it at the Gypsy Lore Society, um, and the paper was on Malthus, and overpopulation, and again, the kind of content production of gypsiness as an excess category. And I was attacked. Thomas, I don't think you were there. I was roundly attacked by all of these elder scholars who, I want to say, as a 20-year-old, or as a 23-year-old, whatever I was, the scholars who, and you weren't there either, Nico, but the scholars who should have been nurturing me and talking to me and engaging with me, as I self-identified as a young Romani woman, and then as a scholar who was, you know, looking at Malthus and Foucault and Derrida and all of these things, I didn't get the kind of mentoring I wanted. And I ended up crawling back to my university with my tail between my legs and deciding not to work on Romney subjects ever again. So we fast forward to, two, I don't know when, but when, when I, I, I realized at some point um, that if I didn't do it, you know, who would in the university? Where, you know, it, it was something that I realized I couldn't actually escape forever despite the attacks that I that I really experienced. So, so part of what I write in my statement, I begin with really the question of Romani studies. And I begin with Gayatri Spivak, who was one of my professors in graduate school. And she, you know, begins where she says, quote, some of the most radical criticism coming out of the West today is the result of an interested desire to conserve the subject of the West, or the West as subject. And I want to begin with that because part of what I think I'm interested in having us discuss is the ways in which, or the kind of problematics of Romani studies as a category. And it really comes back to what Eva was saying about the idea of creating Roma and Romani studies as something outside of mainstream academic inquiry, as something other. And Romani studies as a specialized subject, despite the people who are around the table today, right, the ways in which, and Mihai talks about this in his statement as well, that the, the, the object of expertise that always comes out of Romani studies really doesn't have a lot to do with Romani people. It has much more to do with the Gaji researchers who are looking at Romani people. What it does is 
to go on and inaugurate the West as subject and the subject of the West. The Gaja as subject and the subject of the Gaja. So for me, what does it mean for those of us who are the committed academics, committed intellectuals, leftists, feminists, however we want to recognize ourselves, and Romani people? What does it mean when we enter into an academic space? It calls into question, I would argue, that kind of expertise. So, so it, you know, again, in, in the statement that I wrote, which I'm, I'm assuming you, you've read or you don't need to read, but I move on to ask then, if we've inaugurated this subject of the gajo and the gajo as subject, what happens when what Alayla Abulubo calls hafis or feminists come into the mix? Mm -hmm. The moment of kind of the happy, which could be, you know, the happy that Abu Luko points out is, is the person who perhaps was educated, you know, in the West for her, but, you know, a, an educated Romani person. Or someone who's moved between spaces, someone who's mi who has migrated, right? As Hannah Arendt says, the refugees, you know, we refugees will be the, the avant-garde of our people. What happens when we, what questions are brought forth? And I think, that's a really key question because it brings us to the question of an attention to power that we've been talking about, how power works, but also a calling into question of the meanings of expertise. And again, we have we could have a long conversation about that. But the ways in which we think about expertise, you know, and and the expertise of Roman people, one of the things that I'm always brought back to is that moment when I was 18 years old and my aunt and I sat down and talked about all the books that she read. My aunt, my mother, who didn't finish seventh grade, so they don't have an education after 11 years old, but they sat down and read those books dedicatedly and had arguments with them. And for me, that's expertise. And I think we have to start calling into question and really thinking about how it is that we de-inaugurate the West as subject and the subject of the West. How do we decolonize? the Gajo as subject and the subject of the Gajo. It means a Romani studies or perhaps a critical Romani studies that perhaps, you know, that decolonizes itself not just from the notions of expertise and Gajo expertise that circulate in the academy, but that decolonizes itself from the Gypsy Lorist history, which is both a descendant of and actually an, o an overlapping kind of unit with. And so I want to call upon all of us, the hafis, the feminists, the leftists, the people who have a critical and somewhat radical perspective on this, to begin this work together. And I guess that's where I want to end. Oh, and I didn't talk to you about my work, but that's okay. You don't need to know about my research. Okay, bye. Thank you. I think I've been very enriched personally by that relationship in terms of a critical consciousness, uh, an awareness of the world. And I, I hope I've improved uh, as a person. Uh, it didn't have a positive start, though. Uh, I was a school teacher when I had the first one. And I have to say, I was a, I was a very authoritarian school teacher. I taught badly, I didn't want to excite my pupils, I didn't want to stimulate them, I wanted to control them, and I wanted them sitting in their chairs quietly. So, not surprisingly, some of the travel pupils, some of the gypsy pupils, they resisted there was opposition in the classroom. And first of all, I thought, well, these are bad boys and girls. Uh, they don't want to do what they're told, they don't want to learn. All these stereotypes I've heard about, and they must be true. And then, 
thank God I started to reflect on myself. Is the problem within me? And then, thank God, I started to talk to the children and to the parents. I started to understand these communities. And the way I talked and what I taught changed. And a real relationship was created. And I hope in everything I've done as a teacher, an activist, and a researcher, that I have put the voice of the community as best as I could at the centre of that work. Years later, I moved on from being a school teacher and I was the, what was my title, policy officer for the Gypsy Traveller Law Reform Coalition. And we've been talking about rainbow groups. This was very much a rainbow group, uh, a coalition of English gypsies, Irish travellers, new travellers, Scottish travellers, and a few rock who at that time were starting to come to the UK. And my job was that of a facilitator. I had, I suppose, the understanding of political structures and lobbying to create platforms for the community members. I set things up in partnership with them, but they took the stage as they rightfully should. And that coalition achieved great things, in part because their voice was at the centre. And that coalition achieved great things because there was a pedagogy of hope, there was idealism, which is a very, very valuable commodity. You can do great things with idealism, perhaps even more important than money. Um, and one reason I'm excited by this event is the energy I remember at the coalition meetings, where I was completely energised, uh, and it was almost spiritual, the experience of listening to my co-workers. I feel that here. So we, we have the idealism here, we have the passion. The next big issue will be, can we translate this into a plan? And that will come perhaps today and tomorrow and in the coming weeks and, and months. I then moved into research and the lessons I learned as a school teacher and an activist I tried to apply to research. I would call myself a critical researcher. When I have conducted research, I, to the best of my ability, included the community in the design of the research project, in the data collection, doing the interviewing, but most important of all, I have included them in the analysis. I tried to upskill them, to make them partners in the research process. And I think and I hope that being involved in that investigation has developed their critical awareness. I've seen gypsy women become feminists. I've seen gay gypsy men come out or be more open about their homosexuality. I've seen many people radically transformed by being partners in the research journey. Some people though, they say this research, it's not research, it's not academically rigorous enough, it's propaganda, it's tainted by activism. Should we listen to these people? Should they be funded? Some people say it would, be, it, would, it would be better if we got the money because we will produce objective, neutral research. My argument is when you look at assimilation, when you look at policy failure, it's because the community voice wasn't heard. And the same applies to research. The community should be at the centre. However, 
I don't want to dominate the academic landscape with critical research. I don't expect anyone to think and work like me. We need people with different opinions to create debate. I need my opponents. They're my foil. They're the people I respond to. Their criticism makes somehow my argument stronger. They have a place. I have a place. But my argument is too much in recent years in academic discussion Critical research has been marginalised and derided. And I think that has been damaging to academic pluralism, which we need. I see another obstacle, and that is one of commodification. Research, researchers, academics are under huge pressures now. Universities are becoming like factories. <coughs> And critical research takes time to develop relationships. It's all about trust, knowing the people you're working with. You have to go the extra mile, but it's getting harder and harder to do that in universities. But also, academics are fighting about over status, and that means they're fighting over money. There are some, they want the research contracts and they will use arguments to try and get that money. One is that they are more scientifically rigorous and we, the critical researchers, are the propagandists. And it makes it harder for us to get funding, but also to enable and facilitate the community voice to be heard. And I'm saddened to say also in this dispute, in this argument, there has been a growing level of symbolic violence. Well, the level of debate has moved beyond an academic argument to a kind of war of attrition. This is hugely damaging for Romani studies. It's hugely damaging for our struggle to win over researchers and community members to the research process. Uh, I'm going to move on and I'm going to speak very briefly about a possible vision of inclusive research. Somehow I feel we won the argument when institutions like the European Commission sign up to the 10 basic principles of the Roma platform, that the community voice should be heard. But as we know, the reality is not there yet. But in principle, people have signed up to this. And research should reflect that empowerment. I would like to see greater funding for community-based research, where the community are partners and at the center of this process. I would also like to see a research bank developed, where NGOs, community panels can say, this is what we're concerned about. This is what we want the answers to. And those questions go into a bank which students and researchers can connect with and say, hey, I can help you in this. Let's work together. Rather than the donors setting the agenda, let the community set the agenda. I also think that we've tried through an experiment in Budapest to create greater unity between activists and researchers. And that is through the Roma Research Empowerment Network. I and my associates, we hold seminars in the 8th District, we invite NGO activists, we invite service providers to join with us in intellectual, academic, activist discussion. I would like to see more networks established like this. I think they can be in Bucharest, Prague, London, and so forth. We could have a whole cluster of these types of networks. I also believe that there is a place for the European Academic Network on Romani Studies. The funding will come to an end shortly. But it can still exist as a talking shop, an online forum. Some people might say, well, that's just a talking shop. But actually, ideas and discussion are the fuel of, of I think, inclusive research and activism. 
perhaps more thematic subgroups can be formed. And it would help also if some people refrain from inflicting symbolic violence on those they disagree with. I also think there could be a place for a European Roma Institute. I, I've seen a few bits of information on it, and I know one thing it could address is lead, Roma leadership in the research process. So that's, that could be encouraging. If it's a facilitator, something which can promote inclusive research. So I, I would agree to that. I think it, it would be a good thing. And I think in this discussion today and in the future uh, weeks, we can develop the principle and the idea of the European Roma Institute to ensure it is a champion of inclusive research and scholarship. So, Basically, that's all I have to say, but finally, I would make a final point. That is, this is a wonderful period at the moment, a very exciting time. One of my colleagues called it something like the Arab Spring, but the Roma Spring. <laughs> maybe, maybe, it, there certainly seems to be energy at the moment. The tectonic plates seem to be shifted, and that's worrying some people. That's why some in the academic community are getting very nervous. Change does worry some people, especially when they think they will lose influence. So it's an exciting time that civil society, decision makers, activists, researchers, we all need to reflect, but most importantly of all, develop a plan. So the pedagogy of hope is allied and married to real transformative action. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here and, uh, and share thoughts uh, with all of you. And, and I, I start with a uh, even with some disappointing observations, not here, but at some other events in the last few years, when I when I saw some conferences and other events where there where the situation of Roma people was a subject, but there was no invited Roma lecturer or speaker, and when I asked, and the organizers were were not. Uh, extreme right-wing people, or not even right-wing people, and kind of really nice guys. And I asked one of them, that, how did it happen? And he said, you know, it was so difficult to put it together. We were really doing it the last few weeks all the time, and, and we tried, but didn't find. And I said, next time, <laughs> let me or let others know, and, and <laughs> you help a little bit. But, and, and, and it is, I'm thinking that it's a sort of form of a, in a way, shocking segregation, because it, it, it reproduces segregation. And segregation as an institutionalized practice is also, and that my main research subject, is also so-called hate speech. Because segregation is not only a discriminatory practice, it has a communicative content. And the communicative content is, that certain people, uh, and it can be in different contexts, other groups, certain people uh, should be or are excluded, and then without talking about it, many would think that, oh, there is a reason for that. And, and that is sort of institutionalized and often state-sanctioned uh, sort of hate speech, uh, that is often supported by public money, but, and then it comes to an absurd performance in a way, and that's what we really need to cut. And and uh, so I have been thinking to actually boycott uh, any such events when there is such a thing. And uh, to the I know we are not discussing, or as I if I understand, we don't discuss the draft statement. I just one comment. I think it's a really good thing to try to uh, try to put some guidelines in this sense. 
And it seems to me that, that Roma participation, when it comes to researching the situation and history and culture of Roma, is key. And even very nice and fair uh, and sensitive and respectful uh, research guidelines uh, cannot make it not absolutely necessary. Because even with the nicest guidelines and most best guidelines, without Roma participation, uh, it would be like a theater performance which talking about Roma people, and no one would be in the cast or in the producing team who would have the personal experience what it means. And then it can be an interesting performance, but I'm not sure, or actually, actually I'm sure that it cannot really bring in. It can talk about some other things, perhaps it can show how other people see the situation of Roma, and then it can be relevant, but, but it's not a full picture then. And so, as was mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell something more about me, but nothing, not much more necessarily need to be told. So I have been working on looking for and researching uh, participatory responses to so-called hate speech, and with special attention to anti-Roma speech, and especially legal responses, and per responses by participatory art. And I'm trying to combine the two, so for example, at the second National Slam Poetry Championship, uh, I organized a team uh, with the participation of the uh, wonderful Roma Hungarian slammer, among others, and while we were doing the national final, whole slam from the stage to the slam poetry, which is four minutes short, from a prepared laptop, we sent a freedom of information claim to the Minister of Human Resources, Zoltan Balog, and claimed all information the ministry had about segregation. And at this point, this is at court, because they didn't really give too much. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think, uh, so this can be one example, and, and quickly I just want to mention several, uh, three examples of how part of what should be done is a critical review of the existing scientific literature, and, and among them course books and school books. And one example is in which uh, Nadir played a key role that Many of you know the case, the Yesensky case that at Cornell University and and also played a key and positive role in dealing with it. That there was a, a school book wrote, that was written by the former minister, minister of foreign affairs of Hungary, Yesensky, and and uh, then and the school book had some really really nasty lines about Roma people. And, and that's a typical example. I, I'm sure that if a Roman person would have been in any way included, or of course also in this case, if a non-Roman person with an eye to such, a, with such lines, with such negative stereotypes and prejudices, then he would have been warned not to put that in the book. But it was not reviewed in, in any way of that sort. And so, uh, with, with my course that I have been teaching at the Central European University about such issues, in participatory ways, one of the Roma students from, uh, there were six Roma students that year in the class, and one of the Roma students from Moldova, Cristina Marina, wrote this case as her action against the real life example of of uh, incitement to hatred and prejudice speech, and, and we made it contributed to making it a public issue. We collaborated with Andrew and the, and the vice director of, of uh, Zoltan Santo of Cordens, who was also very supportive to find the problem. And we also made it a legal case. So again, uh, we combined different approaches to, to, to and we also suggested uh, a broader critical review of course books because this is a case when when Nadia bumped into it, 
So he made it a case, and some of us then contributed to making it a case. But there may be, or there are probably many examples which goes relatively unnoticed and cause damage and reinforce stereotypes and prejudices. So uh, something should be done about it as well. And this is, I hope, a positive example when, when some sort of research effort or effort related to research has been done with participation of Roma people, with key role, with Roma people being in key role, and some others, Roma people, working together, joining forces with them. Uh, then another example that a group of uh, uh, Hungarian students, one of them is partially Roma, did a, a review of, uh, of high school books of history and ethics, about how Roma people are portrayed in those books. And then they invited me and some others to perform some parts of the, those books in a participatory theater. We did it in Kestyudyar at Mátyástér. And then Peter Bogdan made it sure that the theater was participatory very much, so the audience could join. And so the, when we did the performance, then I guess in the courtyard of Castle there are many Roma children were playing and jumping around and, and that was the back so the audience saw them playing out there while we were doing the theater and Peter Bogdan joined the as a audience participants and made one of the most wonderful performances of the whole whole uh, whole performance and at his own initiation he actually played a racist person who has anti-Roma stereotypes. And uh, the third example I mentioned is just shortly and then I close with one comment on vocabulary. So the third example is which seems to me an unused opportunity. There is this, uh, for foreigners, I mentioned typically uh, that, that there is this German occupation memorial at Sabachak there in the center of the city, which actually, uh, in a pretty absurd and outrageous way, denies responsibility for the Hungarian uh, Holocaust, uh, responsibility by the Hungarian society. And there has been a lot of protest about, against it, but largely the, there is an effort there called Living Memorial. Every weekday afternoon, early evening, a group of people are sitting around there and telling stories and invited lecturers are talking about usually related subjects. And, but the participants are mostly elder people, many of them retired people, and Jewish Hungarian sense are strongly represented. And that's why I say it's an unused opportunity, not only for Roma people and, and the coalition of activists of Roma and non-Roma people, and also, also younger Jewish Hungarian activists. So a lot of, that's a performative site with their History can be reflected upon, critically reviewed, and actually made, and constituted, and claimed. We can claim history there together, and we can also claim through that, we can claim a positive, inclusive understanding of what it means to be Hungarian, and it can be done, I suppose, in similar ways in other countries around as well and what it means to be a patriot in our countries. So I suggest that that site it can be used more and quickly just about the vocabulary. Uh, in the background of this whole research issue and, and the fight about those issues we have been talking about yesterday and today is in a very difficult mindset the very often segregation and discrimination is kind of taken for granted. As I mentioned yesterday, it has been taken for granted that a wonderful Roma Hungarian cannot be candidate, couldn't be candidate at the parliament election because he wouldn't have a chance. And it's kind of accepted. Even very active people who are sensitive to human rights and equality think that if they don't accept it, that's a mistake, they are stupid, they are dreamers, they are whatever. And, and I think that's the huge mistake, and, and we have to turn it around, and we have, to, we have to fix the vocabulary, for example, in the context of uh, often Roma and non-Roma Hungarians as well are talking about like Roma people versus Hungarian people. 
And by, I understand and totally support and, and observe very gladly how Roma identity is emphasized and, and Roma nationhood even, and, and also when Roma Hungarians are, 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 are presenting the special culture of Roma people. But also I think it's, it's important to combine it, as it is in the case, similarly in the case of Jewish Hungarians, to combine it claiming to be much better Hungarian, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian than racist people. We are better patriots. Whatever minority we may belong to or we may not belong to. So I think, uh, and, and the research uh, that we have been discussing can, I think, support that and can help us avoid research that actually reinforces prejudices and negative stereotypes and produce even racist speech. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to the organizer for inviting me here and thank you also to Joanna for this invitation. And um, I, I, I want to, to enter into, into the topic by, by remembering what, what uh, some others said yesterday because I, I think it's very important and it's the best entry point that was I can make. If, uh, if I remember when the uh, Professor Atkom yesterday made a remark that the Roma as a political project uh, was something that was taught by uh, others, by Gaggio, uh, as you say. I mean, the idea of, of unity of the Roma was something that, that was taught by, by Gaggio. I think if I'm right, I mean, this is what I understood. Then uh, I, I remember what, what Nicola said at one point, that uh, when analyzing the, the Roma uh, civil society, that we, we should have a historical perspective. And she, she remember an instance from uh, the Little War period. For example, when the Roma activist organization were used and instrumentalized uh, against other minorities, against Hungarians, uh, against Jewish, maybe whether we can say that they were constituted in, in a minority in order to be instrumentalized against that, or maybe this is too much. But, however, uh, we, 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 we have to look into the history in order to, to have a right understanding of the knowledge of production. And, and I like what, what the Enrico said, that uh, we cannot think outside of the uh, context of political uh, regimes. And that maybe we can see that uh, there is the neoliberal workers that promote a kind of civil society in order to minimize the state. I, I'm not sure if I took it rightly, but uh, if I if I was not taken rightly, I, I like the idea how however. So um, how how to look to, to, to this uh, um, produ production of, of uh, knowledge about Rome. So myself I, I found allies and I found concepts that I, I think are very useful. Uh, in the sociology of knowledge and the, in the history of science, because as I say, we, we should look back in the past and try to, to bring the, the memories uh, up, up front. And um, I try to, to look how is the truth constructed, what the claims of the truth are constructed, and what scholars are saying about this. And, uh, yeah, I, I've been fascinated to find that. Uh, the, the truth is constructed by, by a strategy of framing, of party framing, so you have to cut something from the reality and to build data. Data are, are not natural, someone is cutting, it's doing categories, it's doing practices. Yeah. And then you, you have to interpret the data in so on and so forth. But, but in cutting with the, with the social reality in order to, to say something, and to say something with data, you, you have to, to make compromises. You, you have to, to make trade-offs how for their own social job knowledge. So this, these two, two strategies of training and, and cut-offs are, are very much in, in, in the academic production of knowledge. But then I, I try to look historically because I, I was interested by, by the fact that during the 25 last year it was produced that there was produced a lot of studies about Roma. There are so many that I cannot even read or follow. 
が死んでいると思います。もっと少なく、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ
Well, we've been saying we don't need objective, we just need critical theory. But we do actually need to be objective in our analysis about the damage done by very nice racial scientists like Eugene Bittard. Um, so I, I just, the complexity of that and the, the, uh, the deconstruction of continuing racism, which isn't inspired by wickedness, it's just a scientific mistake, is very important. Thank you. So, uh, first here, right? And then there. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And here also Yeah, but here was first. Let's choose here. Maybe first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love to be a gentleman. <laughs> so um, you hear me, yes? I don't have to stand because I hate standing. Um, because it's a question of power, that's why. Um, I've been through... Um, I, I try to be sure, but I do not promise that. <laughs> Being a 20 years old activist, um, three years ago I decided to go into academia for an internal debate, not for the sake of being an academic, because I didn't want it to be an academic. And I thought that I entered in a world where, you know, debating and uh, it's an open space, where critical thinking is at home, but it proved that it was not like that. Critical thinking is not at home in um, any academia because it's that again, because of my feminist, I discovered the question of power. And the creation and the knowledge production was created by people on power who had power. And um, the, the uh, knowledge um, about Roma was created by people who had power. So it's normal that it was created by other races or non Roma. We can make discuss which ones were good or which ones were bad, but it's a question of power. We didn't have that power until now. While um, I went into university, we, I had, I mean, the, the, the discussion of creating the Romani studies, it falls under the general current, uh, uh, general discussions which were around Afro-American studies, feminist studies, uh, um, I don't know, Hispanic studies, a Jewish studies even. So, what what do we want from this um, new construction? It's a new construction. What do we want from the Roman studies? We want uh, um, uh, knowledge production just for the sake of knowledge, or we want knowledge production for the sake of action? So that's a paradigm where I always have a debate with my especially of political philosopher teachers in my in my university, friends of mine, but not. So that's a question we have to put to ourselves. If this Roman studies responds to knowledge by for the sake of knowledge or it responds to knowledge for the sake of action for the need of action. So um, um, that's a question where we have to answer. Of course I'm for the knowledge of sake of action, but <laughs> anyway. Um, Yes. I think that Roman studies should be contributing and be part of a new project of political Romani identity. And if, without Roman studies done by Roma for, for a political, new political Romani identity, we cannot go further. And I think it's one of the most important objectives like rec recuperation of memory. Recuperation of Holocaust, recuperation of art, recuperation of everything we have as an identity marked as Roma. Roman studies should be produced. And um, I also would say um, the previous session and the session yesterday, I am I'm tired but not yet very enough to be to be at home now, is that I'm tired to react all the time. And what we do now is that we react to what others done to us along the history. And we have no time for constructing alternatives because we all the time we are in the dynamics of reacting. We react to races, we react to, uh, to knowledge production, we react to everything because we are so busy to react to everything 
they did not have time to construct alternatives. So maybe we, that's the same with Nakalina. We get, we have no time for constructing. Doing so, the PhD is every scholar's, <laughs> it shouldn't be, well, yeah. it should be every scholar's chance to do that bit of construction. It is construction, but it, was a, it, it, it becomes from me as an activist as, as a reaction. It was seen by my, my professors as, a, as an activist standpoint of view. Even though they appreciated the quality of the work, it was still perceived as a, a PhD, which I just cut three weeks ago, which a PhD from a, an activist standpoint of view. For action, not for the sake of knowledge. So, um, I don't know where we go with this discussion, but it's, I, I just tell you I have enough of reacting all the time. Sometimes we have time to construct alternatives, not only reacting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I mean, to be correct in terms of ladies and gentlemen and the others, uh, you know, we have a uh, really so you will have a really challenging and, and hard time in, in this field. Because uh, as Peter mentioned this Yezensky case, this was a moment which changed radically my opinion about academic excellence. Uh, I am uh, educated in my, my generation at least, uh, at least I believe that was uh, edu uh, educated to trust and at some point to to believe uh, what the academic uh, truth is and how it's serving the human kind. But when I, I read this Yezensky paper, I, I, I changed radically and I don't believe it anymore. Not in, also to you here, sorry to say, but you know, uh, I realized that the knowledge production, it serves its different purposes across the history of human kind. This is the first point. Second, if we go to read all these uh, uh, research papers or whatever, whatever academic paper, articles or that, I mean, your generation is now entering this field and probably, hopefully, new Roma will enter in this field. I mean, half of them should be taken the degrees. I mean, to, those who wrote the, the research papers on Roma. Because I find them not uh, just uh, not respecting the, the that time's uh, academic uh, standards, but also non-relevant uh, in that time, describing and prescribing the, the Roma community. And this is uh, lasting not in the last 200 years, but it's more long period. And uh, I wrote to to. Mikhail stayed uh, around and on the voice of the group. That in general there are four discourses how the academic research is trying to explain our existence uh, or being in, uh, among the people. The first one takes roots from the medieval times, denying our religion, that we don't have religion, that we don't have language, that we don't have history. So, we don't exist as a people. So, I, our identity was totally denied in the medieval period. What do you mean by medieval? <laughs> in English, medieval ends in 1500, whereas this discourse yeah. is the discourse around 1600. So, it's the, it's the second period of discourse, not the medieval discourse, which is different. I mean, it's more uh, 1500 because we started uh, oh, 15, 15. Yeah, from religious uh, authors. I will, be, yeah. I will yeah. try to, but to, to, to summarize the, what was already mentioned and how I understand the issue. The second discourse is uh, trying to, to, uh, to attach to us all the negative associal uh, labels that are existing among humans. And basically, it qualifies as a criminal, liars, a social, and all these kinds of negative labels that the, the, the human beings are having. Yeah, and even they, they are saying that even we don't have music, you know, as a role of music. It's such a uh, technical generation that there. 
The third one, most recently, starting after the 70s, is trying to visualize our behavior. We're trying to describe how we, what is the situation and how we, we do it and how we, we behave. And throughout this visual, visualization, uh, they are only proving that, look, these are the robots and these are the reasons why they are living in such a situation. And the fourth one, that we already mentioned, the, the genetics. And the genetics, not just from the Nazi era, but even before, and Another still one. there are some genetics using it. You said the 70s. You mean the 1870s? No, no, no. no 90s. 90s. Anthropology. And, no, I think you... Well, you should have met the 1870s because that's when that was all started. I didn't reach so far, but probably you know more, much more details about it. So, uh, I advise that you start to fight all these fake uh, papers produced on the robot. Uh, together with Andrew and with Peter, uh, we, 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 we attacked uh, Jesensky, and his academic career is uh, finished in, in Hungary. But we should also do it, I mean, you should do it uh, for the new, newcomer. Because now it's much more easier to question whatever view. It, is, it was not easy some 40 years ago, but now in this period it's much more easy. Um, no, not this. Um, so let's go in order and I uh, ask everyone like at least two minutes, not more. And then we're like, you first, and then you, and then uh, Hiroshiko, then, and then you, Violetta, and then Julius, and then uh, Lisa, and then you. And you were the last one. Okay. Uh, I think you were the last one. 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 I'll talk as loudly as I can for two minutes. Um, thank you. Um, at the end of the first session, when I was summing up, I mentioned uh, that we discussed quite a few concepts like um, feminism, neoliberalism, Roma, etc. Um, but we haven't really, we could discuss each of these for a day to nail down what we mean by all of these things. But of course, the biggest elephant in the room for all of us in all these kinds of discussions is the concept of Roma. What on earth do we mean when we talk about Roma? Okay? We mention it a lot of the time, but we don't ever actually preface it with a definition about who or what we're talking about at any particular moment. Um, I strongly recommend Mihai's book to everybody. It's the best deconstruction I've read about the concept of Roma, and I hope when it's published everyone will read it and will see the challenges that it, that it, that it poses to us all, and we can work our ways around those particular challenges. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about something that Andrea said. Pardon, Mihai will explain. Um, um, Anna, you kind of, when you were discussing, you kind of implied that you saw that academia having an influence over the way knowledge production is, is, is used within the policy framework. I'd actually say it's really the other way around. It's really the politics comes first and the political need. And us as academics, and frankly us also as activists and people involved in this, we tend to have the bit part of legitimating it and facilitating these things rather than actually challenging themselves, challenging itself. Really, as academics, what we have to do is go where our theory and research and information actually lead us to. And this gets me back to a comment I wanted to make about Andrew's point, which I do understand what you mean about doing research uh, in, in terms of um, in conjunction and respecting the wishes of the community. And I can see how that might work in certain kinds of research projects. But in many research projects, it can't really work and it shouldn't really determine how, how academics are doing their work. We can all come up with results which offend or upset or confuse or challenge other people's deeply held beliefs and we shouldn't be afraid from doing that, uh, apart from the question of who the actual community is in any particular context. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Then I'll pass it on. Um, behind you first. Okay. I think you should I'm reflecting back to what you said about co-producing knowledge with uh, members of the Roma community. We are doing a project and we are using action research to produce not, not only knowledge but also plants. 
And uh, we are doing this within a frame uh, that is constructed on the basis of collaboration between a municipality, uh, round representatives and service providers. Mm -hmm. And we are doing this in purpose so that the knowledge that we are extracting from the community is built into the community policy. And uh, we are doing action research and we uh, taught a group of 15 uh, researchers and we introduced qualitative uh, uh, methodology and they went through an extensive preparation. Actually, we worked with uh, a team from the University of Central Lancashire, we have social workers. And I would prefer now to give the mic to Arso, who is a member of the Roma team, to talk about how he uh, perceives his role as a Roma researcher and who developed some projects on the basis of the data that was collected. Okay, I will Everything that I hear here is extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. But I think that this is highly intellectual work of the researcher. And uh, I think that this is highly intellectual work of the researcher. Трябва да следе долу при тези обикновени хора, за което господица, за които господица така да че няма с какво да се нахранят с ниско образование. Давайте възможност на подобни хора да се занимават с изследване, настъпват някакви види на ретел качествени промени в тези на живота. Providing them with the opportunity to become researchers, to collect data and to analyze data, uh, make them change in a particular way. Използването на изследванията по този начин, те да бъдат правени от обикновени хора в общността, ми дава и тази сигурност, че след това действията, които ще последват, са наистина това, от което общността се нуждае. Going back to the community and uh, providing uh, the research methodology to these people from the community makes us sure that the actions that we will develop further are reflecting their own needs. So this is the most important part. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Thanks, first of all, for putting this together. It's, it's wonderfully stimulating and engaging. Uh, reflections that I will need some time to adjust. But just to pick up on some of the thoughts expressed, I think surely one of the things that has come up uh, a number of times is that this whole Roman studies environment leads more often than not to understand something about Roma researchers than Roma themselves. And I think this could be actually a very interesting platform to explore and address the, the radical respect for uh, difference and diversity that Ethel was talking about. I mean, to see how we as societies, as Hungarian and European and Spanish society, deal with difference and frame it and act upon it. And this is also where I think the whole discourse on anti-discrimination and racism comes in and is really key, not only as an intellectual tool, but really for framing policies. Because some things such as, I don't know, um, the European Commissioner for Justice talking about the Roma that need to sort of accept normal or normal behavior in order to integrate, I think really reflects something that is deeply wrong, meaning that it is a human rights issue. And in this sense, I think that anti-discrimination is not so much a human right, but more of a characteristic of all human rights, in the sense that, uh, and, and we can really learn about, from let's say the disability issues. Yeah. I mean, this is a framework that in legal terms has been much more articulate and structured because it's newer. So treaties and UN conventions have much more stronger protections. And in this sense, I cannot imagine uh, a politician saying, well, I mean, disabled people really need to become normal in order to integrate. So I, I think it, it really, I mean, we need to think about, obviously, we have a functional, dysfunctional society. And it's not about a minority having to adjust to that. It's how do we rethink this whole framework? And I think this is a very good debate and platform to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay, then um, let's uh, pass it to Violetta.
And then Jack. Okay, then these two young ladies. Okay, afterwards. Two minutes. Okay. Um, so, just wanted to touch on three things. Um, and one is that I'm really, I'm really pleased to hear so much talk about what I call participatory research, inclusive research, critical research. Um, and it would be really good to reclaim the fact that participatory research sits on very strong foundations, actually, um, generally. And um, so we can make a very strong theoretical case for how it's done, why it's done. It comes from way back in, in liberation movements in Latin America. It has very deep roots and it's actually very prestigious. So, you know, let's, let's talk about that. And then the other thing is that when we do it, it's really interesting to look at the details of how it's done. And I just wanted to thank you very much for interpreting all the time what people are saying, because that's one of the examples in which we do participation, is when if you can't speak English and you're not the English-speaking majority, you can still participate. So those kinds of little details that we do so well to be highlighted. And then lastly, I love that you started talking about critical whiteness and I've heard other people, such as Angela Conte, talk about it and I just want to say I am very keen to go there and um, look at my own white identity and write from that perspective and I'd really like to talk to you about it to hear what you think should happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, I am, but I need to be, and I'm going to be the last one. Um, yeah, but I am after her. So I uh, I give to Bill, and then I'll be the last one. I'll take the place to Bill. Um, I actually want to get back to a little bit more practical level, as we are later talking about these ethical guidelines, and I think this panel is actually perfect to already brainstorm on what we could add to that. And um, I think we should also go, go beyond um, criticizing only the existing knowledge and the existing pictures um, about Roma, but also in general of uh, hegemonic knowledge production, because it's very much about the condition of knowledge production and the institutional culture behind it, and, uh, like, and of, of knowledge production and becoming visible. That is, of course, representing social reality in a very crucial way. So I just wanted to ask you to maybe reflect on, uh, and we have started it already, so what kind of concrete steps could be taken to actually change how yet uh, the patterns and structures of knowledge production are functioning. And um, like going further, like for example the question of quota, you mentioned the funding, so all these very practical issues which we could really tackle. Um, and other questions I have is how we could avoid um, to stay only, like many of you mentioned that there should be an alternative discourse, something which is more coming from, from like, which is more bottom up or which is more done by people who have a better expertise or a more critical perspective. But how could we avoid that these perspectives are co-opted by the hegemonic discourse again if they want to be heard? So where are these kind of points of encounter and really the points of where we could change this um, for that we are not only becoming the servers of the structures we actually criticize here. Thank you. I think you should come. It's easier. I can reach. Yeah? Is that okay? All right. Uh, as long as it doesn't bother you. Okay. Uh, two points. One, regarding the knowledge production and and uh, I have a proposal, or I want to know what your opinion would be about a potential proposal, which I mentioned in what I wrote up in the ethics paper, a review board. It's common practice in the US. I don't know that it's common practice in Europe. I would like to know if it isn't, why not? Can we have something like this? Because to have constant interruptions in the community by primary research, that's not discovering anything new, I think is wrong. It's unethical and it's just not acceptable. And a uh, second point is I attended a course this summer here in Budapest for seven days and for the first five days I heard 
research about this isolated, uneducated gypsy community in this country, and this isolated, uneducated gypsy community in this country. And they call themselves gypsy, so that's why I call them gypsy. And at the end of the five days, I felt like, well, there, there are no Roma people because you only have isolated, uneducated gypsy community. And you think it's okay because after five days, they didn't have the exposure and the knowledge to the things that we have in this room, and you, as someone who is organizing this course, by not acknowledging that the people in this room here exist, are saying that there is no Roma nation, even though you don't say it directly, indirectly, after five days, you have this picture that we don't exist. And I was very upset. And I think that something has to be done about this as well because it's unacceptable to have isolated, uneducated gypsy communities across the continent and not acknowledge that we are here. And on the one hand, call us elitist, and then not allow us to give this information and teach it in the public school system, that we exist to the people who need to get this information in the public school system, so that they stop calling themselves gypsies, or choose to make a choice, an educated choice of what they want to call themselves, because that's what we want, education. Yeah. So you became a gypsy. Yeah. Uh, sorry, you have to go this way. Uh, I wanted to abstain, but I always like order in this order. So thank you for ordering, ordering me to, to say what I didn't want to say. So on, on uh, what uh, Nicoletta uh, spoke about the, the, the power and uh, what uh, Martin was speaking about the, the politics of, of, of research and politics behind or prior to research. So I was hiring uh, an advocacy manager like two years ago and I wanted to have somebody who knows inner work of the, of the government. So there was a person who worked for eight years as chief of cabinet of uh, uh, prime minister of Hungary and also chief of cabinet of minister of interior. Somebody who I guess new uh, in the work of policy making uh, from the governmental side. And I asked him a question during the interview. I said, can you tell me, I want to know what in impact civil society campaigns make on government. I said, do you remember any decision for these eight years of your tenure in the government that civil society changed, shifted, any, uh, or any decision that you in the government wanted to make? He was thinking, uh, no. For eight years. Then I asked him, was there any uh, Roma organization ever shifted your decision? Of course not. And I said, could you say that whether there was any actor who uh, shifted your decision uh, that was not part of the government? He was thinking, well, yes, once, academia. We ordered the research uh, when we wanted to reform pension system. Uh, and of course they knew it was the decision, and they just needed a little bit of science to prove the argument. <laughs> so, then that's one, one point I want to put in. The second point is that, to me, the, the, I do, I'm, I'm really not somebody to, to discuss uh, knowledge production and so on, but the resources avail available for it are also controlled by those, by those who are close to, 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 to those who possess the res res uh, resources. And the control is also about the discipline of, of research. I wish that, for example, Bill doesn't need to, uh, in, if, if he wants to be a researcher, Roma, he doesn't need to go with the sociology or uh, to study education because this is where the, resource, uh, where the resources are allocated. If he is a, somebody with finance background, he should do finance uh, 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 research on Roma, economic research on Roma, political research on Roma. Because I have a feeling that we are trying by linguists, uh, uh, by, by linguistics and uh, sociology to explain everything. Uh, we try to, we use it for history, we use it for politics, we use it for economics. I think of, uh, multidisciplinary research, it should be one of those, those objectives we should strive. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to, to uh, say that when we talk about knowledge production and we talk about uh, racism in academia, we have also to touch upon something important. We have to talk also about racism in academic institutions. Yes. Yeah. And somehow, uh, through my experience, 
through my uh, well uh, uh, working experience, I managed to um, encounter uh, races in different settings where I worked. But what bothered me was not so much to see uh, uh, to encounter races in a government institution. But uh, it did bother me uh, to encounter races uh, in uh, um, NGOs, for example, that claim to work to defend the rights of Roma, or uh, even in the largest private donor on Roma. Yeah? And at one moment, Rubian is not here, he said, look, we have to deal our most uh, 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 dangerous enemies are the liberal racists. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something uh, about my experience <coughs> within the academic institutions. Yeah? Now, academic institutions, the type of racism there, it's more sophisticated. Yeah? Because now it comes with arguments. Yeah? You are not scientific enough. If you are Roma, you cannot be objective. Yeah. Meaning, you cannot be academic because you are Roma. So, if you make a link be between physical characteristics or inherited, like ethnicity, and your capacity, yeah. to intellectual capacity, that's all racist, yeah? yeah? Okay. Well, I am very uh, uh, skeptical to use this kind of labels, yeah, racist, because once you put the etiquette uh, racist, somehow the debate, yeah, ends there, you know. But on the other hand, what, we, what I call liberal racist, also put the etiquette, if you are a Roma, you cannot be academic, you are, you know, activist, uh, peasant, uh, So, how we go beyond this divide, and I think we have to reflect on it. The second point I wanted to make is about, you know, talking, using the terms whites and blacks. Now, let me tell you, uh, I heard in my experience as an activist, one government that used this kind of discourse. And we were racist. No, the Czech government. So, Czech officials, in different meetings, they talked in terms of whites and blacks. And I thought, oh, that's, something is not kosher. When last year, the story of Maria, yeah, the little girl in, in, in Greece, yeah, well, I, I couldn't resist, and though I said, I said, I will not write anything on Facebook on this, I should focus on my PhD, I couldn't stand it, so one night I just, you know, I said, and I, put that, I started a post on my blog, and I said, are Roma blacks or white? I asked the same question here, you know, Jericho, are, are you black or white? And he said, I am grey. And then I remember, I remember this kind of discourse, because in the early 90s, Adam Mitnick, uh, 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 Polish intellectual that I like a lot uh, um, uh, wrote a uh, uh, great essay, why he likes great. So uh, I, I'd be skeptical about using uh, uh, whites, though I know where it comes from, from what intellectual tradition. But when I refer to Rome, I prefer not to use blacks and whites, because we are so diverse that, you know, better not. <coughs> and the third point I wanted to make is about another term that I consider pure racism and that's called Romology. Now, I never heard about Hungaronology, or Americanology, or Germanology, yeah? What is that science on people? I know, I don't know, at Mitra University, there is a department of Romology. Uh, believe me, believe me when I hear, you know, Romology, I feel like, you know, we are some kind of evidence. That it doesn't matter, Roma can be also racist, that's uh, not an argument, yeah? Mm. And believe me, we are also racist because uh, we are not perfect. <laughs> or are we? And sometimes we have reason to be racist. We have reason to be irrelevant. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay. I'll uh, well, we we were talking here about many things, about many. Uh, 
many interesting things. What about in the future? What, what, with what we gonna go from from here? What, uh, what we gonna be in the, what we gonna make in the future? What, what is, uh, what for all the all those workshops? What for? Are you going from here with uh, more motivation to change the situation? Are we going to unite ourselves to, to change the situation? Or are we going to stay like this and uh, doing nothing and uh, uh, the activists fighting on the grassroots against the abuse police, against the court abuse, against uh, all the societal abuse that they are doing, power abuse? What's next? Let's start. I'm sick of it. I'm uh, I'm sick of it to go at the Commission European, at the Parliament European, coming here and uh, to, uh, and to hear blah 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 blah. But nothing is going on. Nobody is doing nothing. And I'm sick of of this. I I like uh, I don't know who said yesterday. Uh, let's do action, but action with with reflection. And uh, the, the action is very important to 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 be bring, brings uh, to be brought with the uh, with um, uh, with impact with impact. But impact who 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 make the people. It's like uh, when the 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 impact uh, comes to that person to be like this. Uh, hey, wake up or something and do something. And that's why I wanted to be the last one and to talk, uh, to hear all the, all the, all the reactions. Exa exactly, all the reaction. Let's start from now. Yesterday we took a decision together with one of the members, of, with one of you. We, uh, we, we start something. We start to discuss yesterday with, uh, with you, with you, with Bill, uh, with uh, Saimir uh, about Let's start from here to make a campaign and to 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 go to uh, uh, why I'm, I'm saying this. Uh, it's a new commissioner. Yeah, one minute. Uh, it's a new commissioner who came. We can sensibilize uh, the commissioner to come with a strategy to change the situation of Roman and to bring the um, the, the the laws uh, at the, um, all member states and to put pressure on the local mayors, on the government, on the media to stop all these uh, uh, manipulations, all all these uh, discriminations, and so on. And we were we were thinking uh, last night what what name to give to the campaign and the. Um, and to come with, with ideas, the ones who wants to be involved, to come with ideas, uh, what impact brings uh, the plans, like uh, uh, Mihai was saying, uh, and I don't know. And uh, uh, after, after uh, you know, in, uh, it's very important to, uh, today when you go to sleep, uh, this evening, uh, this night, when you go to sleep, just think about it. How how to make uh, how to make uh, to bring solution and to work together? Why I'm saying uh, when you are sleeping before you go to sleep because you are uh, you are uh, you are more um, relaxed. I can say you are more relaxed and you you can uh, you can think more uh, than uh, you uh, by by the day. And uh, uh, now we're gonna be in the break at the breakfast. Uh, uh, it's very important to, to talk about it and to come with ideas and to to, to put all this on the list. But before we go to thank you. Before we go to the break, uh, let our panelists uh, um, make a, a short reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, because we have time until 5 p.m. So I encourage you, like you want to speak. I know. This was, I think that was quite a great debate. I would like to uh, endorse what Julie was saying about his experience in the academia. I actually left, I, I've been working as a, as a Roman activist for many, many years before I entered to academia with this whole illusion of me being so naive that this is a space of, of I'm pretty, well, the same thing that Nicolette has been. This is a place for freedom of thought, of critical thinking, of, of uh, this space where you can actually uh, 
freely say what you think. I discovered uh, also a great disappointment that this is a space ruled by uh, power interests, by money, uh, driven by funding, and a place of uh, uh, a lot of hierarchies also. Within, within and in, inside, the academia, but also towards the outside world. So it seems that there is some type of a hierarchy of the knowledge production for knowledge, for the sake of knowledge, as Nicole was saying, or for the sake of action. And also, at some, at some points, I, mean, I really thought that my, me being Roma and also being very open about it always has, has a, that sometimes been seen as an obstacle to a, a, academic excellence. Instead of being seen as an advantage, it might capacity to enter the Romani communities, to understand certain dynamics and so forth. Uh, but on the other hand, can we as Roma claim legitimacy over knowledge produced of Roma, just because the Roma? Yes or no? Exactly. And if then uh, we cannot do it, who can claim legitimacy over knowledge produced of Roma? I think these are uh, very important questions that we have to reflect on. And, uh, just to, to finish, I'm kind of disappointed that we haven't entered into uh, structures and institutions that legitimize knowledge because I thought maybe tomorrow there will be a space for, for doing that. I mean, there has been a lot of heated debates on, about the European Academic Network on Romani Studies. Many of, of uh, its members are here. Also, uh, Ethel was mentioning the Egyptian society and the legacy it left and the influence it still possesses in actually shaping the Roma and the, the knowledge of the Roma and framing the Roma issue as such. So I think we really should uh, think about this, and I endorse the last comments about doing some action. I think this, these meetings in, the, in Budapest that we are promoting as part of a, a, a research and uh, empowerment network is a great idea to push for new energy, for alternative discourses, for uh, a lot of criticism, but in the space of open-mindedness and the welcoming environment that actually goes into building uh, a discipline that's very diverse and pluralistic. Maybe just uh, one sentence that is very much inspired by what Nicoletta Bitti said about um, you know, um, knowledge, a active activism-based knowledge and, uh, and uh, action plan, action, knowledge that produces action. But I also uh, would like to uh, put a, a small footnote here saying that we not have to wait for the formation of, of grand institutions and European bodies and we also don't have to put all our trust into European mechanisms or some, uh, some uh, transnational network that we finally managed to break out because it's always possible to simply start a bit small and place that ideal, which is very much uh, characteristic to Central European activism, that we place this ideal somewhere in the future and we don't start to create here and now. And it's very important to return to the community and just, let's say, rent a uh, vegetable stand like we did and start a contemporary art space if we have the capacities to do so. So that's just an example, but there's many others. Um, you know, this is what John Nancy described as the ultimate creation of the world. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Here's to the ultimate, the ultimate creation of the world. We can do this. Um, and I think, well, I, I actually want to say, because I, I absolutely understand and I, I know that we desperately need to produce knowledge for activism with communities. And that's really, that, that is one of the fundamentals. But I think we also have to think that, well, I want us to, I want us to remember Gramsci. And I want us to think about theory and praxis together. Because we can't have one without the other, right? And so when we talk about the question of knowledge and knowledge production, that also, yes, it's informed by our practice always. And I think that's where our new research paradigm comes from. It also then in turn informs our practice. But we can't have one without the other. The kind of instrumentalist, you know, activist-led research, yes, we need that. But if we do just that kind of research for concrete action in that way, we're going to be replicating exactly what governments do, right, in, in instrumentalizing particular forms of research. So I think what I would rather propose in a very concrete way, or I would, I would like us to remember concretely Gramsci and the theory praxis kind of combination. And also the position of ourselves, Roma, non-Roma, but as organic intellectuals, as coming from communities and being responsible to communities. And those two things for me are key. But I, and there are a couple of other things that I want to say. Um, because, well, and just to finish that, because what we're doing in terms of our politics 
in terms of, in, with regard to having a kind of engaged scholarly practice, right, participatory um, research, but also a scholarly practice that, as we know, right, as, as, as you said, it's, it's never divorced from anything. We're always parsing, we're always shaping, we're always framing. So that, as framed by social justice, framed by a critical attention to domination, framed by an attention to what the needs of multiple communities are, our communities, really becomes a new research paradigm. But the other side of that research paradigm, right, and here I'm thinking of Kuhn, I'm, I'm really talking about a kind of paradigmatic revolution. Um, the other side of that research paradigm also has to be the idea of a knowledge production that is a Romani knowledge production that will in fact change the power dynamics of the academy. So yes, the academy is racist, absolutely. But part of what our job is, practically, as scholars, as, as activists, is to also figure out in positive ways where the knowledge that we possess, possess where the research that we carry out can actually shift of the ways that this kind of dominant, racist, sexist, homophobic, da, 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 these formations actually work. And I think that's our job, and we do it together. Right? I mean, and again, it's a co-production. It's not just the scholar and the imagined, the sort of mythical community of illiterate Roma in the countryside. <coughs> I guess that's my community, too. Okay. Um, but, right, but, but to actually think about it as a constant co-production with everybody. I'm sorry, I will shut up in a minute because I know we're totally <coughs> over. Um, but the, the, then again, I want to also move forward to the practical ways of decolonizing. So yes, I think we have to talk about the academic network. We have to talk about gypsy lawism. We have to talk about you know, how do we reform these spaces that, that have been here and that have such power. But also how do we, we push to reform the funding for academic projects, the academy itself, you know, when well, I won't get into that. And then, <laughs> but, but then also the question of mentoring. You know, that moment that, what, what I think is really important is that those of us who have the knowledge, who have the kind of power to do the necessary mentoring, we need to take that on. And on the other hand, people who need and want mentoring also have to kind of be open to doing that. That we have to figure out a way to formalize the intergenerational transmission of knowledge and of expertise because that's really key. Because you know, I have a ton of non-Romani, um, well-meaning kind of students who write to me constantly and are like, I have an idea for a Roma-based project. Would you point me to a Romani community? In fact, could I go to your, your community and do research? And I think, no, actually you can't. You're not allowed. I'm not giving you that. What I'd like to do is to figure out a way to mentor you or to mentor everybody into then doing the kind of co-produced produ research that we're talking about. And finally, the Institutional Review Board. Yes, we need an Institutional Review Board. I mean, it shouldn't just be for Romani studies, right? It should be a larger one. In the US, it's, it's a few kind of a research project without filling out a hideous 40-page report, you know, a kind of thing on an outline of what you're doing and what it's going to do to the community. But we should have that, and that should be part of our ethical guidelines to demand that for any research that's carried out in our communities. And we can do that. We can push to actually have that be part of the requirement for carrying out the research. And then my final point about who can claim legitimacy within a racist, sexist, homophobic, hideous, hierarchy, hierarchical structure. Hello, Adrian. <laughs> Adrian can claim legitimacy. Adrian Marsh can claim legitimacy. Um, I think it's really key that I, I'm, I'm going to go back to what I wrote in, in my statement, right? The halfies should be claiming legitimacy. But any kind of halfie, right? Anyone who has a critical perspective, but who also can come forth and say, this is the critical perspective, this is the power dynamics, and this is what I'm going to to work to dismantle with everybody else. It's not going to be just you know Adrian and and any goal, but it will be all of us together doing that. I'll shut up now. I'm very sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it's you guys okay. Then one more, and I think we are keeping out. Yeah, really. You want to talk more too? Awesome. So really shortly, I just want to highlight that that I think it's really. 
uh, helpful to use a variety of instruments, including academic uh, research, including legal, and including artistic and other civil society actions. Also because we face a lot of hypocrisy, <laughs> including at academia. So we may push some changes in research or existing, uh, existing uh, literature, and then we bump into a wall. We may not be able to move forward in academic discussion at certain points, but if we are able to use the anti-discrimination laws or other instruments, or including laws against incitement to hatred, uh, then uh, those laws are part of the part of the structure, part of the power structure. And if some people are not taking that seriously, they are just dealing with them as kind of a, as Jack was said, as a pre part of a predominant blah blah in a hypocritic way. Let us take those instruments seriously and take the hypocritic people even to court or to other authorities and let's have those laws enforced and let's have public pressure support the proper understanding what such regulations mean and finally let's really rely also on art sometimes I feel like art comes up all that kind of rosy thing it's academia is serious stuff no art is really helpful in many ways at academia as well for example in at Central European University in my course for the last two years I've been doing the performance of the hate speech monologues and Yelena Jovanovic and Rana Dorut and Simona Dorut were wonderful participants and such a monologue for a big audience of largely non-Roma people can help to open eyes on even unconscious prejudices people may carry and turn those people, many of those people, to allies in what they are talking about. And uh, just a very last example I finished with this, that in, in the other participatory art, participatory art form I really like, slam poetry, the Roma-Hungarian friend, Sines Bob Horvath Christoph, he produced with Roma school children a wonderful slam poetry performance which was spread in video. The title is Tudás Hatala, Tudás Hatala, Knowledge is Power. And young Roma school children with him are, are doing that slam poetry, kind of rap, really powerful, really eye-opening, really inspirational. And it's really related also what we have been talking about in terms of research and knowledge production and critical and also the critical review and critical attitude towards research. Thanks so much. I just want to focus on the question that was posed earlier, the where next, and we, we mustn't lose sight of that, but we need to be increasingly focused on that because today uh, and tomorrow. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I, I feel the ingredients are here. There's energy, uh, idealism, many of us have common interpretations as well, which will create a sense of unity. The next thing is the plan. And I, I kind of go back to the coalition I worked in, and it grew organically. And that, you know, it's going to be difficult for us in so many different countries. I counted about 14. But it is possible. As was said at the beginning of this event, the European River Rights Centre uh, will produce a journal which will summarise and capture many of the arguments and issues raised there. Personally, I hope it will be timely, as soon as possible, early in the new year, because the time is right. Um, also, I think that journal could be a real handbook, which can extend this network. And I think there are many who agree with us, I think there are many who've got something to offer. I also think we can stay in contact through our Facebook page, the Roman Research Empowerment Network. We have a Facebook page with about 300 members. If you're not a member, uh, I strongly urge you to join. And maybe we'll put up tomorrow on a slide 
details of how you can join. Because we should really update each other on our struggles, what we're doing in our countries. And we can learn from each other. We can be inspired by each other. And somehow we can see how we're progressing in our plans, in our work. So those are just some concrete suggestions I wanted to uh, put forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it is to, to conclude, I have only two to agree with what Martin said before, that um, I think the knowledge production about Roma is very dependent on the policy regime. It is not, not different from, from our day. I think it was like this in history. So, uh, it's first that the political elites that creates a Roma issue and then the academics that jump on and flatter on this. So it's a, it's a poor construction, but it, it sits at this level. So yeah, I think this is the point of view. Now I'll be closed this official part and we continue in the garden. I think because now this place is closing, I think, so we should continue outside. Okay? Thank you for your participation.